Welcome to part 4 of the Bread Circus's Phantom Menace retrospective. In the last part, we examined the obstacles keeping our heroes on Tatooine. All of them evaporate at the same moment, allowing the party to move on. The ship is waiting for the last passengers to climb aboard. If you've seen a few of our videos and feel like we've earned your support, please take time to check that you're still subscribed to the channel. Leave a like, perhaps. Fiddle with the notification bell so you're notified as soon as we upload new videos. Why not join us on Discord? We promise it's only half as bad as that sounds. I found perfection here. I've created it. If you'd like to support us financially, consider becoming a patron or clicking join under this video. YouTube members get access to Imperial rank insignia in the comments section. The Phantom Menace tends to create its characters in pairs. Two Jedi, two Sith, two Nemoidians, two Huts. These are the matching pairs. We could say that there are two so they can talk to each other. Having two Jedi lets them talk about the Force amongst themselves. But Master Yoda said I should be mindful of the future. But not at the expense of the moment. Be mindful of the living Force, young Padawan. Explaining the Force to an outsider is an entirely different conversation. We can also pair them into a hero and his personal antagonist. Queen Amidala has a conflict with Newt Gunray. Anakin must deal with Sebulba. Shmi Skywalker's main tormentor is Watto. Obi-Wan's patience is tested by his foe, Jar Jar. Misa proposed that the Senate give immediately emergency powers to the Supreme Chancellor. Why were you banished, Jar Jar? As for our dear friend Palpatine, he must defeat Chancellor Valorum. Every character needs an appropriate foil. It wouldn't be proper for little Annie to address the Republic Senate. The biggest problem in this universe is the Hutts are gangsters. The nemesis allocated to Qui-Gon was Darth Maul. Two of our characters are Jedi Knights, extremely powerful beings. They need an opponent of a similar power level to cross blades with. Against a trained Jedi, most battle droids are no threat at all. A competent, menacing adversary is needed. Drawing your sword in a cantina isn't particularly heroic. For a proper lightsaber duel, you need someone like Lord Darth Vader, capable of defeating even an experienced Jedi in combat. We can't expect Emperor Palpatine to wield a red lightsaber himself. That would be undignified. Also a bit incriminating if he was caught with one. Darth Maul is quite similar to Vader. Both are apprentices to Emperor Palpatine. Both are physically imposing and visibly hostile. Maul has far less elaborate clothing since he isn't a cyborg. Not as many buttons and switches on his chest. Aside from his weapon, Darth Maul has two distinctive features. First is the red and black tattoo pattern all over Maul's body. Since Maul is a full-time Sith Lord, he can get facial tattoos. Otherwise, he might run into career issues. Hello. The other thing is that Darth Maul has horns instead of hair. These exist to make Maul look menacing, even without wearing a black mask. Sometimes we speak of Darth Maul more as a weapon than a person, a sharp implement whose purpose is to be wielded by a superior. From a certain point of view, this is absolutely correct. A certain point of view? Maul was never a Jedi like Vader once had been. His entire life was dedicated to being the best Sith apprentice. Once upon a time, Palpatine discovered a valuable resource, a Force-sensitive child the Jedi don't know about. From that point on, little Morley was trained in secret. Since the Sith are so clearly sinister, this training could easily prove fatal. It included being locked in his bedroom with a pack of dingoes. Darth Maul is a Zabrak. This is a species new to the prequels, with two notable examples. Maul himself is from the Zabrak homeworld of Iridonia. The only other example of a Zabrak is on the Jedi Council. Eeth Koth has a different skin color and horn layout. Finding a consistent explanation for this variation has eluded me. Darth Maul and his master are very different. Darth Sidious can only appear when Senator Palpatine is out of the public eye. He gives instructions and plans his schemes. In contrast, Darth Maul can roam the galaxy and take action. 
Secrecy is essential, since Palpatine does not intend to be discovered. Maul cannot act overtly, he must be stealthy and subtle. These tactics are effective, even if they may not be his preferred style. At last we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last we will have revenge. You have been well trained, my young apprentice. They will be no match for you. Maul is first called in to deal with a range issue. It's impossible to locate the ship. It's out of our range. Garth Maul. He will find your lost ship. Qui-Gon led the Queen well away from the Trade Federation. Outside their own territory, the Nemoidians have little to no influence. They cannot walk in and claim Queen Amidala from a hut prison cell. Sending a droid army to Tatooine would be even more unwise. Do not meddle in the affairs of huts, for they are subtle and quick to anger. <laughs> Newt Gunray is right. The Queen is out of their range. Even if they knew her exact location, there is no way to capture her. Darth Sidious sends his apprentice to resolve the situation. His plan starts with a little deception. The Queen gets a message from C.O. Bibble. The death toll is catastrophic. We must bow to their wishes. You must contact me. Back on Naboo, the situation is rather grim. The Trade Federation are withholding food until the Queen returns. Obi-Wan, the heartless monster, suggests this is a trap. It's a trick. Send no reply. Send no transmissions of any kind. I suspect C.O. Bibble has no idea he is bait. Viewing the message is almost certainly a safe operation. Being able to track that way would be catastrophic. Sending some kind of trace report through the comms network means increased traffic. A subspace message system would not establish a two-way TCP connection. That would only be possible with two subspace radios in range of each other. Doing that using a relay system would be too slow. Subspace messages back and forth across the galaxy use UDP packets. As soon as they hit the relay network, they are on a best effort delivery system. This message has likely been relayed across the subspace comm network. If so, it will have been broadcast across the entire galaxy. The Naboo ship's subspace transceiver picks up the message as it passes through Tatooine. Alternatively, this could be a holonet message. Move the ship out of the asteroid field so that we can send a clear transmission. The holonet was the system used by Vader and the Emperor to talk. This is how real-time, two-way conversations can happen across the galaxy. In this case, it was a pre-recorded message. The death toll is catastrophic. We must bow to their wishes. You must contact me. There was no live conversation going on, so even in the case of the holonet, it's fine. There still should be nothing to give away the Queen's location. Technology is not the weak link that causes the security hazard. Immediately after the Jedi established that this message is bait, we cut to Coruscant. Two Sith Lords are taking a stroll around the city. They casually discuss how they have already traced the Queen to Tatooine. Send no reply. Send no transmissions of any kind. It sounds like bait to establish a connection trace. If the trace was correct, I will find them quickly, Master. Despite how funny that is, the movie doesn't play the interaction for laughs. Someone aboard ship ignored Obi-Wan's instructions. It's hard to say who that might have been, since the Queen had left already. It could have been a pilot, or one of Captain Panaka's security officers. One would expect those military types to appreciate the value of radio silence. No, I think there are only a few likely suspects. Handmaidens are more likely to have taken the bait. Specifically, I blame Sabe, the one serving as decoy for the Queen. Padme, clean this droid up as best you can. It deserves our gratitude. If not her, then it's probably definitely Rabe. We'll get to the bottom of this, one way or another. Send in the ITO interrogator droids. Transmitting a response almost doomed the Queen in exile. By subspace relay or holonet, the reply gives away its location of origin. All Darth Maul knows is which planet to search. He sets off immediately. At last we will have revenge. You have been well trained, my young apprentice. Maul's ship arrives above Tatooine on the same day as the race. This is quite clear from the sequence of events in the movie. First, it's daytime in Mos Espa when Maul traces the hollow call. Darth Maul lands that night and attacks the next afternoon. Crossing that distance, a quarter of the galaxy, 
took only a few hours. To make matters worse, we know things about its hyperdrive. Darth Maul flies a ship named Scimitar. The type of ship is a Sith infiltrator, which primarily means this ship has a cloaking device, or rather, had one installed afterwards. Scimitar is modified from a Sinar Design Systems courier ship. The ship isn't all that much larger than a TIE fighter, except for the length. Main issue is that the Scimitar is listed as having a Sinar SSDS 11A hyperdrive. The hyperspace speed of this ship is class 3.0, slower than many freighters. If this ship can travel that far in 6 hours, a better hyperdrive can do it even faster. The galaxy rather shrinks. Anyone can get anywhere in a few hours. Frankly, it's unbelievable that a Sith Lord has such a slow ship, unless the cloaking systems are so cumbersome they can't fit a faster hyperdrive. An infiltrator's primary asset is its stealth in sublight situations. Having a fast hyperdrive isn't strictly necessary for the mission profile, I suppose. However, that cloaking device is obscenely expensive. Given that you're already spending so many credits, you could at least buy a class 2 hyperdrive. One of the later RPGs addresses this inconsistency. According to Wizards of the Coast, the infiltrator has a class 1.5 hyperdrive. That's much more reasonable, slightly faster than the Queen's ship. Having landed on Tatooine at night, Darth Maul disembarks. He has the general location of his quarry. Clearly, he wasn't able to locate the Queen's ship by scanning for it from orbit. The Sith Apprentice starts to examine the landscape in front of him. He has spotted at least two settlements nearby. Using a set of electro binoculars, he can see easily in the dark. Each town forms a glowing spot on the horizon. That's quite a lot of ground to cover. Maul isn't going to search it on foot. He releases a set of dark eye probe droids. These split up along the way to the various towns. The Sith probes search all night and the next day. There are plenty of droids buzzing around by the day of the pod race. These are not particularly suspicious to the casual observer. Many kinds of lightweight droids look like this. It is specified that Darth Maul built the dark eye droids himself. The design is a perfect replica of a blueprint he found in a Sith holocron. What's really nifty is that the droids were assembled using standard components. Watto probably sells all the parts needed to build one. Putting a new droid together probably takes less than half an hour. In the novelization, Maul's probe is destroyed as little Annie leaves home. The movie has a dark eye droid reporting back to Maul in person. The Sith apprentice has unloaded a speeder bike from his ship. In contrast with the original Stormtrooper bikes, this is unarmed. Maul's bike is named the Bloodfin. It's a Sith speeder, a similar situation to the Dark Eye droids, based on an ancient design. Or so the Sith would like us to believe. Everything about the speeder bike's hardware is modern. Where the name Razalon FC20 comes from is unclear. I think the Razalon company makes a base variant, which Maul modifies. Perhaps the Sith Holocron has generic advice to offer about bike maintenance. Increase your top speed by 30% with this evil trick. A coating of paste made from the blood of orphans to eliminate all air resistance. Who can say what fiendish Sith alchemy they get up to? All speeder bikes are fast, this one more than most. The Bloodfin represents the only vehicle smaller than a spaceship. If Maul needs to walk a long way, he has the option of taking a speeder bike instead. As we can see, there is a small thruster at the back. The other distinctive feature of the bike is its shape, a circular body with a seat in the middle. Compared to other speeder bikes, this makes the Razalon FC20 a compact design. There is also talk about the circular design having a lower center of gravity. That really depends how you look at it. A normal speeder bike is mostly linear. All the machinery is directly underneath the seat, plus it extends forward and back. Importantly, all of its weight is down low. The rider sits on top of the bike, which does shift the center of gravity. When a scout trooper bike goes into a spin, the rider rolls around the bike. Its path doesn't even seem to wobble during the spin. If this were a center of gravity issue, the bike would also spin around the trooper. The two would orbit, pivoting around the center of gravity. Unless this is all due to repulsor lifts, 
COG is inside the body of the bike. For Darth Maul, imagine it starts out as linear. Then you bend the centre of the bike downwards. You have shifted mass downwards, both the bike and the rider. Surely, this would have to lower the centre of gravity. On the Razalon circular bike, that isn't necessarily the case. While the middle has been lowered, the front and back are considerably higher now. It's not a big deal for the front, the handlebars and dashboard. That rear section looks rather heavy, and look at the placement of the thruster. The centre of thrust is directly behind Maul's sternum. If we assume that the bike has a low COG, the thruster would be off-axis. There is no lower thruster to balance out any rotational forces. With a low COG and this engine placement, the bike would roll forwards. On a bicycle, rolling forwards is exactly what you want to happen. The blood fin is almost wheel-shaped, come to think of it. The competing assumption is much safer, that the centre of gravity is along the axis of thrust. By putting the COG right in front of the thruster, the rolling effect goes away. The only other explanation I can think of is the repulsor lifts. Perhaps they work to spin the bike in the opposite direction. It's as if the green iron engine was paired with a ventral one, lowering the axis of thrust. That would allow the bike to keep a low centre of gravity. On a fast bike like this one, intercepting the Jedi is easy. Darth Maul landed about as close to Mos Espa as the Queen's ship. Qui-Gon is on foot, slowed to the running speed of a small child. They cross paths just as Qui-Gon returns to the ship. Being a very bad guy, the Sith Lord aims his hoverbike at the wee child, a kid that did not appear in Palpatine's briefing. Maul has never heard of Anakin, he doesn't have a good reason to dislike any. He just wants to run over a child because of how evil the Sith are. Remember that Force users have the ability to sense each other's presence. He is here. Obi-Wan Kenobi. What makes you think so? A tremor in the Force. Someone with as much potential as Anakin really stands out. Don't lecture me, Obi-Wan. I see through the lies of the Jedi. Trusting the Jedi, Anakin ducks under the bike. Next, Maul discards the bike. Not to worry, the Bloodfin has automatic brakes on a dead man switch. This is the first lightsaber duel since the original movies. I think that justifies giving it a very brief look. Sort of a cursory once over, you understand. Would be a shame to gloss over it completely. We shall see what is good and bad about the fighting style of the prequels. <laughs> Maul ignites his saber as he gets off the bike, which I like. As the lightsabers activate, they are already in motion. Qui-Gon draws his lightsaber from his belt, exactly like he would draw a steel sword. Lightsabers are generally worn in such a way that the blade emitter faces down. Qui-Gon Jinn draws his sword with one hand, raising his arm up to shoulder height. While I'm no swordologist, that looks like a good defensive stance. At this point, Maul is barely one meter out of his seat. His red lightsaber blade has just finished its activation sequence. We can't see much yet, only that the sharp end is pointed toward the enemy. So far, we're off to a promising start. These all look like sensible actions for everyone to have taken. The next beat in the fight has Qui-Gon bring his saber around to point up. This looks like mostly a rotation at the wrist. Again, Qui-Gon makes a good choice. Getting the blade point up seems like it'll be an advantage. You want to finish drawing as early as possible. At the same time, Darth Maul does a flip. He rolls forward and swings his saber down toward Qui-Gon. If you look carefully, the blade is aimed nowhere near Qui-Gon's body. Maul has made a wild swing toward the Jedi Knight's sword. This is a profoundly bad omen. The characters are trying to win the fight. They should be trying to hit the opponent. Aiming for the other guy's sword is a laughably bad move. Anyone can see that. So unrealistic. We've already got a flip and a swing aimed at a sword. Surely these are the indicators of a bad fight scene. Well, I've got a couple of ideas. Perhaps aiming properly is difficult to film, dangerous to the actors. We'll just have to keep that in mind. On the other hand, maybe Maul is also making good decisions. Instead of attempting to cause a fatal wound already, this is a control move. Maul knows that he can win this fight, he wants to enjoy it. By attacking Qui-Gon's saber, Maul keeps the green blade away from his head. He only wants to be certain of a safe landing. He gets it. 
Instead of taking an aggressive action, Qui-Gon once again tries to improve his chances. He brings another hand from his poncho, switching to a two-handed grip. Technically, I think this demonstrates that the lightsaber is a bastard sword. It pleases me mightily, because bastard swords are amazing. My ideal sword is a bastard sword by a wide margin. You'd need a chain sword or a vibro sword to be any more appealing than a good old bastard sword. Qui-Gon goes into a horizontal guard position. The bad guy is to his left, so Qui-Gon moves the blade to his left. Again, this looks very competent to my eyes. Having a sword in that position should let you defend against many kinds of incoming slash. Our Jedi Knight now yells, Go! In the background, Anakin finishes standing up and starts running. How far does he run, and in which direction? This combat encounter started less than 100 meters from the Naboo starship. Maul's bike came up to them from behind, then rode past both. Darth Maul is between Anakin and the relative safety of the ship. Once again, we find that Maul's decisions are sensible. Think of where would be the best place to stand during this fight. Obviously, you want to get between your prey and its refuge. Darth Maul has behaved like someone who is very interested in achieving his goal. You have been well trained, my young apprentice. They will be no match for you. He strikes at a time when his greatest threat, the Jedi Knight, is alone. This is a duel that the Sith Apprentice has the best chance of winning. If he can manage to take out Qui-Gon, everything else will be easy. He's already tracked down the Queen once, despite her best efforts at stealth. Even if Obi-Wan gets away, Maul can just track the ship to its next destination. Then he'll have one last saber duel and mop up the stragglers. Captain Panaka would barely slow down the Sith Lord. At this point in the duel, Maul has his saber raised. It looks like he's preparing to swing it either down or from that side. Qui-Gon has his blade high, covering against an overhead strike. He is prepared to defend the side that Maul will attack from. The next move is what's known as a feint. Or rather, this had been a feint to distract from the coming move. By pretending to attack, Darth Maul has forced the Jedi to block in a certain way. A few frames later, Maul has changed the angle of his sword. He moves to strike the area that Qui-Gon hadn't been covering, around the back of the hilt. By the time Maul's aim changes, the Jedi has already started reacting. When the strike begins in earnest, Qui-Gon is halfway into position to block. The strike connects near the base of the defending saber. Qui-Gon has made a good decision to block in this way. Leverage makes his guard stronger here. If Maul had hit near the tip of the green saber blade, it would take far more effort to block. That's not to say Maul has made a mistake, that Qui-Gon did the better thing. The trade-off for power is that the sword tip can be moved very quickly. That's exactly the goal, getting behind Qui-Gon's guard. He doesn't want to connect with the lightsaber at all, so Maul isn't concerned about leverage. During the flip, I said that Maul was aiming for the sword instead of the enemy. This time he's trying to avoid the sword and hit flesh. The final aspect of this engagement is the footwork. Three characters take one or two actions each. Little Annie regains his footing and starts running. Qui-Gon turns around. Darth Maul does a flip. After the feint, Jedi takes one step back while defending. Sith takes one step forward while attacking. You could read a lot into that. Symbolism about aggression versus adaptability. Looking at it purely from a combat perspective, that looks about right. This is the correct footwork to go with these sword movements. There is a lot of established wisdom about the importance of footwork in a fight. In much the same way, there is a trick question regarding tanks. If anyone asks you what the chief weapon of a tank is, there are three acceptable answers. They want you to say the main cannon. Someone too clever by half might say it's really the coaxial machine gun. Maybe the smoke grenade launches, or the radio. The correct answer to the trick question is the engine. Either the engine or the tracks, which amounts to the same thing. Mobility is always relevant in a fight. As far as I can tell, this fight choreography has been flawless. Everyone constantly makes the best choice he possibly could. Assuming this pattern continues through the movie, I'd like to speculate. Darth Maul is one of the most popular characters in the prequel era. 
In fact, he's so beloved that some would rank Maul above Vader. Part of this is due to the appearance. Part is because his lightsaber is particularly cool. I'd like to suggest Darth Maul is popular because he is competent. The same applies to Django and Boba Fett. Both present a legitimate threat to our heroes. We got him! We'll just have to finish him. Much like Boba Fett, Maul is a relentless hunter. We find him appealing because he can present a genuine threat to our heroes. When Maul succeeds at something, we don't sense the hand of the writer intervening. Maul doesn't teleport around, he either follows you or lies in wait. He's just a guy who was motivated to get the job done. After about 10 minutes of analysis, the camera angle changes. It had stayed in the same place for this entire saber duel so far. I really appreciate this. Instead of shaking the camera or hiding the movement, it's all visible. Jumping off the bike, a flip, a two-hand grip, a feint and a block. All of this happened in the space of two seconds. It was clear what everyone was doing at all times. The new camera angle is a close-up of Qui-Gon and Maul. The saber positions don't entirely line up with the previous shot. Maul's saber starts to withdraw before the camera change. The last we saw Qui-Gon, his saber was raised above his head. When we return, the lightsabers are crossed quite low down. This doesn't look like an editing mistake. The overall position is the same, we just missed half a second of action. With the camera change, the roles reverse. Darth Maul withdraws his sword so it can be used defensively. Qui-Gon Jinn also draws his sword back, in order to make his first attack. The Jedi is going for an overhead chop. His aim is true. This would instantly end the fight if Maul hadn't parried. The Sith uses the same horizontal overhead block that thwarted him earlier. At this point, Qui-Gon disengages long enough to give one final command. Tell him to take off! Anakin sprints toward the boarding ramp. Maul's motivation is still to kill the Jedi. Capturing the Queen is a secondary objective, a loose end to tie up afterwards. Move against the Jedi first. You will then have no difficulty in taking the Queen. Qui-Gon wants to protect that ship and its contents above all. Moving the Queen is Qui-Gon's current mission. Anakin's safety and training are very important to Qui-Gon, and most of all, his apprentice is aboard. Qui-Gon doesn't know if he can win this duel. All he can be sure of is that he can keep the attacker busy. If the ship were to fly away and leave him, I know Qui-Gon would consider that a success. Besides, if he won the duel, he could just send a message. His comlink has more than enough range to reach orbit. Worst case scenario, he has to hide out from Watto for a few weeks. All right, I'm sure another solution will present itself. I'll check back later. Perhaps he can find a way to free Anakin's mother with all that extra time. Fitting his role as a distraction, Qui-Gon continues to attack. In fact, he repeats the same overhead attack as before. Maul blocks in the same way, a high guard with the blade horizontal. This is not the most varied of engagements so far. Still, both men have used the same attack and the same block multiple times. The same factors still apply from earlier in the fight. If this downward slash was the best choice earlier, it probably still is. Parrying that in the same way uses the same reasoning. The main reason you need to vary your attacks is so you aren't as predictable. Speaking of which, Maul now does something rather unexpected. First, he pushes Qui-Gon's blade up and out of the way. Then he spins 360 degrees and walks away. For the first time in a fight, a less than ideal move is made. This spin should have little to no practical benefit. Turning your back on the enemy is generally a bad move. At least before spinning, he creates an opportunity. That gives a moment of leeway that can be used to spin. There can only be one justification for this, the Force. Given that this seems to be a bad idea, perhaps it helps to summon the Force to aid you. If that's the case, the excuse only applies to Force users. When anyone else does it, a taunt is all it could be. Maul does seem to fight with renewed ferocity. He starts advancing while delivering a flurry of attacks. Qui-Gon retreats significantly, doing nothing but defend. First, Maul prepares an overhead vertical swing. Qui-Gon uses a horizontal block, but at a lower height than other times. This is only at shoulder height, the previous ones had the saber above his head. Darth Maul continues with a horizontal sweep, though this one may not have been aimed well enough to land. 
Another apparent mistake, unless this was an attempt at controlling the opponent's blade. Qui-Gon is forced into a vertical guard, hilt up at shoulder height. The Dark Lord immediately follows up with a low attack, as far away from the blade as possible. That was no mistake, the two swings were meant to go together. Qui-Gon barely manages to block the second attack in time. This time he blocks with the tip of the blade instead of the root. There isn't a lot of force to this strike, so the leverage isn't an issue. Besides, it's hard to get your hands down to knee height during a retreat. Qui-Gon Jinn is willing to let himself be pushed back. He can see the Naboo ship over Darth Maul's shoulder. When Maul gains ground during the fight, he is walking away from the defenseless targets. Maul wants to finish the fight quickly, then resume pursuit. His fighting style reflects that. Once again, the characters are acting consistently with their motives. A hundred meters away, little Annie has just arrived at the boarding ramp. He is expected. There will be a guard standing just inside the ship. Captain Panaka was probably talking to Amidala at the time. Guarding a door is a little beneath him. What's the worst that could happen? A hut slithers up the ramp. Back on the ground, the sabre duel continues. Maul executes another spin, starting with a horizontal slash. Qui-Gon ducks under the blade, even if he didn't need to. This attack looked poorly aimed. It may have missed even without a dodge. The Sith Apprentice continues to attack, with a series of horizontal swings from opposite directions. The intention with these is to overwhelm a knight whose skills are rusty. Darth Maul has been through slightly more intense training than a Jedi Apprentice. A single failure to block would end the fight immediately. If ever you gamble, eventually you'll lose. Defending forever is a losing strategy. Qui-Gon makes a horizontal slash, connecting in the strong of both blades. Immediately after attacking on his right, he makes an opposite slash. Maul blocks both of these with his saber held vertical. Jedi Knights understand feints and blade control. Qui-Gon follows the horizontal swings with a heavy attack. His favorite one, the overhead vertical war strike. Maul blocks this one with a horizontal guard, well above head height. This is quite interesting and varied dual choreography. The flip and the spinning add a bit of extra visual interest. Both warriors clearly come across as competent. All the variation in their attacks serves a purpose. A flurry of strikes can be very effective, especially if you know what you're doing. Every swing that would have missed was meant to. There are enough concepts in this fight to make a decent lightsaber game. You need about four options for attack direction. High, low, left and right. Add in horizontal and vertical saber positions during attack and defense. Finish the combat system with a punishable taunt spin. Spinning gives a moderate bonus, nothing too overwhelming. Let's check in on the Naboo ship. Anakin has come aboard and relayed instructions from the Jedi. My gun's in trouble. Take off. Over there, fly low. It is good that the Jedi apprentice has a plan. Nobody else knows what to do. Options are limited by the equipment on hand. As a diplomatic vessel, the Naboo ship is completely unarmed. It does have what look like recesses for weapons. With four laser cannons and a fixed forward mount, it would have been well armed. Early scripts mentioned the Naboo ship having weapons, so these may be left over. These were explained to be recesses for the ship's headlights. Another problem is that it's difficult to fire into melee combat. Even if the ship was armed, it couldn't aim precisely enough. Worse still, there are two lightsabers involved. A blaster bolt could be deflected in any direction. Those aboard the ship are almost completely incapable of helping. Obi-Wan Kenobi commands the action here. He interprets Qui-Gon's order to take off. He decides not to abandon Qui-Gon, which is the correct decision. Still, we should recognize that the option was there. If Maul had won, nobody would blame Kenobi for returning to Coruscant. Instead, he orders the ship to fly low, to hover above the fight. As the ship takes off, we get a view of the fight through the cockpit windscreen. These figures are minute on the screen. There is no room for detail. To be easily readable at that range, Darth Maul does another spin. This creates the greatest movement possible for his lightsaber. Qui-Gon holds his saber fairly still, which presents the red blade as the aggressor. For the two seconds this is on screen, that's a fine choice. Spinning has been established as a good trick. If you're going to have a spin, this is the best place for it. Moving the saber around a lot is the most important part of the cockpit view. The Naboo Royal Starship takes off. In a very neat touch, the landing gear is retracted right away. The boarding ramp remains extended. 
The Star Wars universe behaves differently here because of its anti-gravity tech. An aeroplane would take off by rolling down a runway on its wheels. Having the wheels down makes the plane a lot safer at low altitudes. If you end up touching the ground, better to hit the wheels than the fuselage. Repulsor lifts allow these ships to use landing legs instead of wheels. Everything can take off vertically, so nobody needs a runway. Back on the ground, Qui-Gon misses a horizontal swing. The blade clearly goes over Maul's head. None of our usual explanations will account for this miss. Something completely different is happening here. Force skullduggery. Qui-Gon misses his attack because of the interaction between two force powers. Darth Maul was preparing to make a force-assisted leap. The other was a force sense ability. Qui-Gon, being a Jedi, can see things before they happen. He misjudges the time and swings far too early. The lightsaber blade goes over Maul's head. Then, a fraction of a second later, Maul's neck and waist rise up through that location. Only the timing was off. The aim itself was exactly correct. Maul's jump turns into a flip, which I should really have seen coming. Unlike when dismounting the bike, there is no good justification for this. A spin could just barely be interpreted as gathering the force to you. Surely a force jump must tax your reserves, even if just a little. Darth Maul doesn't seem to gain any advantage from making this move. It isn't even part of an attack, not really. The blade does go near Qui-Gon, I suppose. Qui-Gon doesn't attempt to block or even dodge, so this isn't a serious threat. Now that Maul is on the ground, we can see the most likely reason he jumped. Going over Qui-Gon's head was meant to put Maul between him and the ship. On the other hand, Qui-Gon is now clear to reach the boarding ramp. This flip is the first move that seems unarguably a bad idea. That's because we know Qui-Gon escapes from the saber duel. Upon landing, Maul is forced to block. Qui-Gon has prepared an overhead vertical attack, which makes sense. He has plenty of time to prepare for Maul's landing. This overhead swing is the heavy attack, slow and powerful. A familiar attack comes with a familiar block, the high horizontal guard. This one starts above head level, dropping down as far as shoulder height. Immediately after the parry, our Sithy friend does another spin. That actually lines up with the idea of spinning regaining your force mana. By which I mean, it doesn't make sense any other way. That spin will turn out to be Darth Maul's last move. Qui-Gon looks up, decides the ship is close enough, and jumps 25 meters into the air. We don't see the exact distance, but it's more than 5 meters. 5 meters is about the distance to the top of the carbonite freezing chamber. Perhaps you are not as strong as the Emperor thought. Qui-Gon goes a far greater distance than Luke jumped in the original trilogy. That makes sense to me. Qui-Gon is a Jedi Knight from the Old Republic. Of course he would have a masterful grasp of the Force. This is the same principle as Yoda lifting an X-Wing that Luke cannot. Maul was not expecting a jump quite like this, and nor was Qui-Gon. I believe this plan was improvised halfway through the fight. Qui-Gon had intended to be left behind. When his apprentice provided a better option, Jin jumped at the chance. And to keep me from killing myself during this whole thing, I am going to handcuff my arm to this chair. The Sith Apprentice is left to seethe in the desert sun's shine. Maul stands up straight as he deactivates his saber. We have not seen the last of him. Aboard the Naboo ship, Qui-Gon collapsed back onto his elbows. When he deactivates his saber, he is out of breath. He is immediately surrounded by friends, two humans and a droid. Are you all right? I think so. What was it? I'm not sure, but it was well trained in the Jedi arts. My pronouns are. What was it? And. I'm not sure. Naturally, they want to know what happened. Qui-Gon describes his opponent's training. He says that the Sith was well trained in the Jedi arts. Silly Jedi. Don't you know the Sith are something completely different? Well, we saw both of them using the same lightsaber technique. It turns out that Sith are descended from the Jedi. 
Nearly every group of Dark Side adherents is made of ex-Jedi. If not the rank and file, the leader will still have a Jedi background. This extends to lightsaber combat. Since the Sith diverge from Jedi teachings, they inherit many things. The system of seven different lightsaber forms, for example. These were specifically developed by the Jedi, often for use against the Sith. By this point in the timeline, any Sith apprentice will know all seven. Qui-Gon is absolutely right. The lightsaber and fighting style are Jedi arts. They have been stolen and corrupted by the Darksiders. I want you to pay attention to how Maul is treated here. The characters do not panic, but they respect Lord Darth Maul's skill. My guess is he was after the Queen. What are we going to do about it? Our heroes correctly deduce that Maul was here to capture the Queen. Despite the threat he poses, nobody has a plan. <sighs> we should be patient. Qui-Gon advises patience. As long as they reach the core systems, everything will be fine. Even if civilization can't provide protection, there are other resources. Coruscant is home to a temple full of Jedi Knights. Hundreds of warriors could converge if the Sith moved openly. No, the only sane plan is for Maul to wait. He has failed to prevent the Queen from reaching the Republic Senate. His master, Palpatine, will have to modify the plan. At last, the first lightsaber duel is over. Would you believe the entire fight takes only 50 seconds? If you include the bike ride, it's still only a minute and a quarter. Despite all that, we still manage to breeze through it in only 20 or 30 minutes. We like to keep these things concise, as you have just witnessed. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have this week. This episode was meant to talk about Coruscant. The majority was supposed to cover the Jedi Temple and the Old Republic, the politicians and the nearby monk cloister. That will just have to wait for our next installment. Will Robin escape? Can Batman find him in time? Tune in next week, same bat channel. As for the time, well, we'll let you know. The worst is yet to come. The premiere feature has been quite good. Perhaps we'll see you there. That's it for this video. Thanks for sticking around until the very end. We're trying to get each new part out at the same time every week. It'd pay to make sure you've got notifications turned on, so you'll know as soon as that happens. There are two ways to support us. Become a patron at patreon.com slash thebreadcircus, or subscribe, like, and comment. Only the former option guarantees that your name lives on in history. The other is embarrassing YouTube-y stuff. Brandon Smith is clearly using a pseudonym. Das Lol Tractor has a Lamborghini tractor he wants us to know about. Kamikaze Velociraptor, the worst kind of lizard, might also be a girl. Conk, the only thing worse than a Discord moderator, an Australian. And Zafrax, who gave us a whole bunch of money and then disappeared. What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? I'm a Toydarian. My trick's gonna work on me. Only money. No money, no parts, no deal.